As we go into late fall and more specifically November, it's really a time to start thinking about how thankful we are or maybe how thankful we should be. That's what we're going to talk about today on Uniquely Bristol. Hi everyone, I'm Mark Thomas and this show is a show about the unique hidden gems of Bristol where we all live, work and play. It's produced by the Bristol Development Authority. Now this is 80 acres of heaven if you're an outdoors person. We are at the Harry C. Barnes Environmental Nature Center and with me is the uh, Executive Director of the Environmental Centers of Connecticut, Scott Heth. And, and Scott, I think people forget about how great fall is to being outside. It's, uh, it's one of my favorite times of year. The bugs are, are not so uh, invasive. Um, it's cooler. Lots of things going on in the environment. Animals are getting ready for winter, so you have all the squirrels and chipmunks scurrying around. They're slicing nuts from the trees. They're falling to the ground. Um, birds are migrating. Insects are getting ready uh, to, uh, to get ready for winter as well. So it's just a great time to be outside, all kinds of sights and sounds that you can experience. Let's step back a little bit. The Environmental Centers of Connecticut, yeah. it's, it's a bunch of different facilities and does a good things for our community. Why don't you explain a little bit about that structure? Absolutely. Well, Environmental Learning Centers uh, of Connecticut, the, the mission is to inspire the appreciation and enjoyment of nature through conservation and education, fostering a healthy environment and an improved quality of life. And we do that in many different ways. Our primary focus is education. So we want people to get outside. We want them to know why nature is important, how it's healthy to be outside, um, how it's important for us to, uh, to conserve um, open spaces and, and wildlife. We have the Indian Rock Nature Preserve, which is on Route 69 in Bristol. And that's our environmental education wing, if you will. And, and it's not open for general visitation, but we have the Indian Rock Summer Camp there. We do uh, meet about 20,000 school children a year wow. through, through field trips there. And we have a lot of special events um, that one's coming up is called Santa's Farm. And we do all kinds of different things to, to try to get people to, to come out. Um, and here at the Harry C. Barnes Memorial Nature Center, this is our really our community nature center. This is open for visitation. Right now we're open Thursday through Sundays. We have exhibits inside. We have great trails here. Um, and people can come when they want to and they can experience nature um, outside here. Let's talk about those trails because it really is for everyone, no matter what the age group, there's four of them. Red, white, blue, and, and uh, <laughs> yellow, I guess, right, is it, right. or yellow or orange. So what are the differences on those and what would people expect to see if they took that trail? Well, the, the, the trails are, are very diverse in, in what you can see, as you suggest. Um, we have the red trail, which is, which is our short loop. Um, and so people just want to come out for a, for a quick walk, go see the stream, um, get right in the shade and, and experience what's out there. They can do the Red Trail. That's actually been renamed uh, Elmer's Way uh, in, uh, in honor of Elmer Matson, who helped start this uh, nature center here years ago. Um, the other trails just go further afield. We have lots of um, um, geological formations that you can see. You can see um, um, an esker, you can see um, various other rock formations along the trails. Um, we actually connect from here to Sessions Woods uh, mm -hmm. um, Wildlife Management Area, so, so there's lots of hiking opportunities here. I think what's cool too is I love scavenger hunts and treasure hunts, right. and you've even kind of done that that, uh, that probably kids would go to, but it's, it's good to kind of get around. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, it's just a way for, for you know, um, people to not just walk the trails, but just try to be inspired to find things. And you know, it, our, our sense of observation sometimes is clouded. You know, we, we just walk and, and, our, and our goal is to just walk and get from point A to point B. But what we're really trying to do is get people to, to observe and to look around as they go because that's where the discovery will happen. Now, I'm a hiker. I am obviously not dressed to go hiking <laughs> today. So for somebody who may not have done it or a reminder of those seasoned pros that are hikers, right. 
Tell us about the clothing, the shoes, and the things that, that they should have to make it the most they can. Sure, well of course it depends on, on where you're hiking and how long you're going to be out for. Planning is really important. Um, so, you know, if you're just doing the red trail, for example, here it's a short trail and so you can, you can wear comfortable sneakers and things like that. If you're going on a longer hike, you want to have uh, comfortable clothing, loose, loose fitting clothing so you can move. Uh, make sure you take plenty of water, of course. If you're doing a, an extended hike, you want to be prepared. You want to have a flashlight just in case something happens and, and you don't get back when you, when you uh, think you uh, are going to. You want to let people know that you're out and where you're going so that if you don't return. Um, we can go yeah. looking for you. We can go looking for you, <laughs> exactly. The trails here, they, they all loop back on themselves. It's very hard to get lost here, so, so it's a, a good place to come. Well, you started off by saying uh, that the Environmental Centers of Connecticut is all about education. Right. I think it's very cool. Why don't we take a look inside because you have static exhibits, but you also have live animals. Sure. Okay. Barnes Nature Center is free to the public. It relies on donations to help bring in new exhibits to the center and take care of the live animals. To learn more, the Environmental Learning Center of Connecticut's website is www.elcct.org. So Scott, as much as wonderful outside, it would really be a shame if visitors didn't come in and come inside because you've got a ton of different exhibits. Uh, tell us about what's, what's in the Nature Center and then we'll get to this handsome fellow. <laughs> Well, you know, we, we want people to be outside. Um, that's our major goal. But we do have exhibits inside that sort of make that transition to get them thinking about the natural world. And there's nothing better than, than having people close up to animals um, like this owl. And so it, it sort of leads them to the outside. That's the goal for all the exhibits that we have in here. Now, this is a barred owl, not a barn owl. Right. Tell us about this guy. So this is a barred, B-A-R-R-E-D, because of the barring on its, on its breast here. Um, it's a native bird. It's, it's very common in, in these areas. You can hear them at nighttime. You can even sometimes see them during the day because they're not as nocturnal as other owls are. And this bird um, has been injured, um, so, it, so it can't be released. And all the animals that we have here in, in uh, Barnes Nature Center, they're, they're either injured and can't be released, or they're the result of people having them as pets, and so they're used to being pets, and so they, they can't be released as a result. We would never take something out of the wild no. and, and to, to put them on. Exactly. Yeah, it's not a zoo. This is an education center. Exactly right. Um, and, and to prove it's interactive, this guy has a, has a neat name. And how did he get his name? <laughs> his name is Houdini. <laughs> and we had a contest with uh, local uh, school kids. And they came up with all different types of names. And we thought this was very unique because it's spelled W-H-O-D-I-N-I. Kind of like the who of an owl plus the Houdini. Um, and, and owls are very elusive and they're very silent and, and, and stealthy. And so they're was, great hunters. And they're great hunters and so it was, it was a perfect fit for, uh, to, to use the name Houdini. Now besides Houdini, we've yeah. got uh, some other live animals here. We've got um, some amphibians, we, right. we've got some others. So what, what can people expect to see if they come out? Um, well, we've got um, um, two other uh, species of birds, live birds here. We mm -hmm. have a red-tailed hawk and we have uh, um, two screech owls. Um, we have several species of uh, snakes and, as you say, amphibians and frogs. We have box turtles, um, all kinds of different things. They're set up in, in nice exhibits and there's, there's lots of interpretation. So it's not just, here's a box turtle that talks a lot about, you know, what the native habitat is for a box turtle, for example, and, and why um, they're uh, becoming uh, rare in the state of Connecticut. Now we're standing in front of a photography exhibit, but you even have uh, events that people can book out here, don't you? Sure, we, we have all kinds of events um, throughout the year. We have weekend programs. This is, as I said before, this is our community nature center. So we have, uh, you know, weekend programs, walks and talks, craft things for kids. And, and uh, we have special events like uh, Trailside Tales is a, is a sort of a, a, a non-scary alternative to Halloween where people can go out into the woods at night and, and learn some legends about, um, about uh, various different, different people. We have a car show coming up um, and those types of things. We do, we do art exhibits, we have art openings. So we like to, you know, nature and art and music and the arts in general go hand in hand together. So we like to incorporate um, those together. Well, I'm sure this guy is extremely thankful since he can't go out into the wild. Scott, thank you so much for taking time with us. 
Remember, this is the Barnes Nature Center. It's at 175 Shrub in Bristol, Connecticut. We'll be right back. Welcome to Bristol. Nestled in the heart of Connecticut, just two hours from Boston, New York, and an hour from the shoreline, Bristol offers a unique New England experience. City size with small town vibe, you'll fit in no matter your pace. As a community, we're rich with history, overflowing with passion, and ripe with experiences to enjoy. Beyond the rolling hills of Connecticut, that's where you'll find the magic of Bristol. With an incredible 700 plus acres of park systems, inspiring museums and cultural programs, and the oldest operating amusement park in North America. Our arts and entertainment will color you convinced. And local food and drink establishments to keep you excited, satisfied, and always savoring more. Community events that leave a lasting memory. We really do have it all. Plus, we're a community that honors the brave. A community that offers top-tier sports and recreation. And world-class accommodations to suit every style. But what if you wanted to stay even longer? Well, there's neighborhoods to pair with any personality. And places for all kinds of producers. Top-rated school systems. Ways to make an impact. And plenty of places to worship. So whether you're vacationing, passing through, or staying a little longer, bring your heart to Bristol. Our heart is always open to your experiences. Bristol, Connecticut. All, All heart. You know, some days are just a little bit better in my job, and this is going to be one of the good ones. We're here in late fall, and when you start thinking about November and December getting near the holidays, you can go back to your childhood, you smell, and a lot of the things I think you remember are meals. And today we're very lucky to have the executive chef at the Doubletree in Bristol, and we're here in the Willows restaurant, uh, Alexia Fliss. And Alexia, one of the youngest female executive chefs, yes. uh, Connecticut, Connecticut native. Tell us how you got interested in food. I think it, it's a family thing with you, isn't it? It is, yeah. You know, I grew up and um, my mom was always cooking. My mom and dad were always cooking at home, and it was just kind of something that I always love to do and love to help them out with growing up. So it kind of just came naturally to. And typical in this. this area, you stayed in this area, you've made yes. your career here. Now, you went yes. to school in Hartford, I believe? I did. I went to Connecticut Culinary Institute. Now, executive chef, that has a special connotation. I know just enough about. Yeah. The culinary arts, that, yeah. that, that's a lot of training and you earn your certificate. What, what makes a chef? Um, what makes a chef is I think somebody, you know, obviously having the skills to do it, but also somebody that's passionate, that, you know, loves coming to do their job every day. Because this isn't, you know, you have to really be passionate about what you're doing because you have to pull from, you know, seasonally and locally and, and what's going to go good with certain things. And it's not an easy thing to do. And we're very lucky in New England because you're not very far from the inlet and you've got a lot of natural right. resources. Right. Very popular now, farm to table. Right. It's very, it's very popular and we try to do it here. I try to get a lot of our um, vegetables from local farms. I work with our produce um, purveyor to just try to see what's, you know, local. I like to try to get some stuff from... Um, uh, Caribbean farms and Rogers Orchards and right. stuff when when I can see that um, our purveyors ca carrying that stuff from Lyman Orchards I like to bring it in for well and that's got to be very good because we're supporting the local economy but we know how fresh it is right it, it's coming from 10 minutes away not you know across the country and far right. away <laughs> now your experience you've had a pretty good uh, mentor I hear you worked for Tom Colicchio for a little while I did uh, after I finished up my internship here uh, in West Hartford, I went to Craft Steak at Foxwoods. Right. I was there for about a year and a half, and it was an incredible experience. Right. You know, well, I, I think I, everybody knows Top Chef and, oh, and, yeah. and, and yeah. all of that. Could we <laughs> see you on there at some time, maybe? Uh, no, fun fact. If you ever worked for him, you cannot uh, be on the show. You know what? That I looks, know all his secrets. That's why. <laughs> it, lo it looks so torturous. I think that's probably a good yeah. thing. So, Alexia, we're at the Doubletree, and I know these are what one of the things the Doubletree is known for, these popovers. Yes, Tell us about people these. come in asking all the time. Um, there are signature popovers. So a popover is really just a, a very heavy egg-based uh, bread recipe and you bake it at high heat for it to rise out of the pan kind of like the way that it did here. And we use, there is Gruyere cheese in them, but we also do a couple different ones back there that I'm not going to tell you because that's right. our secret. But uh, yes, you know, just it's very simple, but when they come out of the oven nice and hot and you have them 
it's they're just incredible. It's funny to hear you say heavy when you t and I mean right. this is so perfect. Right. I mean, I'll I'll show you guys. <laughs> when you look on the inside, they're almost completely hollow. Perfect. So it, it's a nice way to start your meal, you know. <laughs> it, it looks big, but it's nice and light and, right. and a great augment to this meal. Yes, yes, it's, it's really, really good. <laughs> so let's talk about, we're getting up into the holidays, and I think a lot of people think of heavy foods, you know, uh, turkey, steak, beef. But today, we're going to talk about salmon, which I think people really need to think about. They've got family coming in. They want something that's uh, very quick, but also nutritious. Tell us a little bit about what you're going to make, and then you got to tell us the secrets. Yeah. Um, so today what I'm going to make is a porcini wild rice with a pan seared salmon and it has a Dijon maple glaze on it and then next to it is our uh, pan roasted Brussels sprouts with bacon and finished with a balsamic glaze. That's perfect. It's, it, it's, it's heavy. You should smell what I smell. <laughs> Let's get the salmon. Talk to us about like somebody's going to their um, you know fishmonger or something. What should they be looking uh, for? in a piece of salmon You really want a nice, you know, it, you don't want it to look too, it sounds silly, you don't want it to be too, too bright pink or bright red right. because then that's when you can tell that they add chemicals to it. So really? you want it to have this like pale pink color, um, you know, just nice all around. There's no slime to it. We take the skin off of our salmon here. So obviously there's no skin, but no slime on the skin. You know, just a nice firm piece of fish. It's not breaking up, you know, it's not Right, no, it, yeah. it looks great. There is so. absolutely no smell, and I, that's, oh, what, no, that's yeah. as, as a novice, that's what I was always <laughs> yeah. taught. Yeah, so you never want any smell on your salmon when you buy it, and if you see it and it looks slimy, that's really never good either. Okay, so we're going to start out with the salmon. I guess that's going to be first. Yeah, yep, I'm going to pan sear it because we have to finish it in the oven. It keeps it more moist inside instead of um, keeping it in the pan the whole time. So in our pan, I like to use a blended oil. Now, what does that mean, unblended? Or a blended. Oh, it blended is oil. blended. Okay. So it's 90% canola oil, 10% olive oil. If you just used olive oil, it would go up in smokes, in flames. Okay. Olive oil has a very, very um, low smoke point. So, so this is all about temperature control and making sure you don't have a flame or a risk then. Correct. You don't want it to, you know, completely burn your salmon when you put it in. All right. Now, is there any type... And you, and you also one? want that nice sear sound when it drops in the pan so you know that it's going to get that nice crust on it. So that was preheated well before. Correct. Yeah, I, I, maybe about five, ten minutes you want to get it nice and hot. Now, is, these are, I'm sure, professional pans that, that you use every day. When somebody's doing a, a salmon like this, is, uh, is the cookery or the, you know, the hardware that you're using any different than uh, like a Teflon? This looks like, is this stainless steel? Or? This is just your standard stainless right. steel kitchen pan. I mean, some people, you can do it in a nonstick pan at home. We personally don't like to use nonsticks in the kitchen unless we're making breakfast. Right. Just because you won't get that nice crust on your salmon. Got you won't it. get that nice crust on your steak if you want to pan sear steak. So, I'm sure the people saw that, that they, she put salt and pepper yes, on here. Yes, I just so. did a little salt and pepper. It, it doesn't need much. It's a nice piece of fish. So next I'm going to start with our rice. Okay. So th this is a long grain or a wild rice then? It's a mix. It's a long grain wild rice. Okay. So. Okay. See, I act like I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> That's why you're here. No, you know. You know enough. <laughs> So I just put a little uh, clarified butter in the pan just to get it going. Now no. this was par cooked and back just for time purposes for what we have. Got it right. But we're going to finish it here now for you guys. So why why would you use butter? Is it for flavor instead flavor. of the oil? Okay. Flavor. Okay. And then we cook our rice here in vegetable stock. It just gives more flavor than instead of water. Now is there any certain kind of measurement that you're using or is this just um, you're kind of doing it by sight seal yeah, or is it yeah, all, the, all the experience? Once you, once you start doing it long enough you kind of uh, you kind of know exactly how much you need you know and then you have that option to add a little bit more because nobody likes mushy rice. Right. So you know I like to add a little at a time a little bit and then keep going and then see if I need to add a little bit more. So is this for flavor? Is it for moistness? I mean... Um, the vegetable stock? Yes. Well, this rice was only part cooked. So, because as you know, rice typically takes about, you know, 15, 20 right, minutes, right. 25 at home. Um, so we like to part cook it. I'm going to check my salmon here. See, I get to distract you. And see, it came out perfect. See, you knew exactly nice where you that. were. Yeah. Nice skin on that. You can tell by hearing it, too. Yeah. Oddly no, that's, enough. that's good. So now we've got another one. Yes. Now I'm going to start our Brussels sprouts. This one I use clarified butter. 
Now, is Brussels sprouts something that is seasonal? I know you can get it because of different things, but... You can get them year-round, but it, it's, it's a seasonal thing. You'll find them cheaper. It'll be a lot easier to find in the grocery store this time of year. Also, right. they'll be a little bit cheaper, which is always nice. Right. Um, yeah. So. Now, I have to think, because I'm not the healthiest eater, but we're talking about... Well, that's about why we're adding bacon in here yeah, for you. <laughs> <laughs> you knew I was coming, right? But, I mean, this, this is a pretty healthy meal, isn't it? It's, it is. I mean, granted, you're in, we like to use butter and salt and well, restaurants. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, but, yeah, for, it is, it's, it's really healthy. You know, we also have your nice heavy ribeye steaks here. We have a beautiful osso buco. You know, it's, it, it, we cook it in the oven for about eight hours. Right. Nice, low, and slow. And this is going to transform after the first of the year. You're getting a pizza oven that you get to play with. We are right behind me. There's going to be a big, nice pizza oven. I can't wait. Well, we're see, we're now all that's really excited. That's the food that I probably gravitate to. I can appreciate this, and I love salmon as we were talking. We're, we're, don't get me wrong. We're still going to have these dishes. Right. Okay, good. And it's also going to, it's not going to be, you know, your typical pizza place where we're doing mozzarella sticks and french fries either. We're going to have dishes just, just as good and, you know, really nice pizzas. Now, Brussels sprouts, it... You must have done some work on those because those are all oh, evenly yeah. cut. I mean, yeah. it, what's the trick to that? Brussels sprouts, they have a little knob at the bottom of them. They're essentially baby cabbages. Oh, okay. So if you ever look at a cabbage, that's what a Brussels sprout really is. So you cut off the knob on the bottom, you peel away your outer leaves, and then I just cut them in half. I blanch those for about 45 seconds to keep that nice bright green color right. in there And as well. so just more flavor for the bacon? Correct. I mean, you can't go wrong with bacon. Oh, never. <laughs> But you, you can put bacon in anything and make it taste better. You want to talk, chefs have to be multitasked. You have three things going, you're talking to me, and you have no sweat. Yeah. I mean, uh, how do you do that? Is that just experience it, or confidence? You or? just got to get used to it. You know, when I first started, actually, when I went to school, I went to school to be a pastry chef. Really? And mm. when I went to the casino, um, when I was at Foxwoods at Craft Steak, I was doing pastry there. But it, it, it's kind of one of those things where you realize that everybody goes out to dinner for a meal. That's right. Not everybody comes out to have dessert after. I wish everybody would, because we, right. we also make great desserts here in-house. But I'm, we're going to finish this in the yeah, oven nope, now. Nope, so I'm that's good. Just bring this put down that here. down. Um, and we're going to show you what all of this looks like. So we put that in the oven. How many minutes would that be in there? Is that more of a touch? Uh, it's more of a touch thing. Some people like this. I mean, we like to serve ours a little like medium in the middle, so it's still very, very not right. raw. But you can, you can eat salmon that way. So probably about 10 minutes in the oven. At, okay. At home, maybe 15 at an oven at 350. Ours at are a little stronger here, but... Okay. So, so really, you're just kind of sautéing these things as... as right. We're finishing dishes. our rice. We're going to finish these Brussels sprouts, get a little higher heat on these to get a nice crust. Now, if we were doing this at home, a lot of people have gas or whatever. Do you, have, do you know what the temperature may be that, that's ideal? Because you don't want to burn it, but you also got to be able to cook it and sear it. For the rice and the Brussels sprouts? Right, right. I mean, medium heat. Medium heat. Yeah, okay. this rice, essentially, if you buy boxed long grain rice at the store, you can do the same exact way I'm doing, except when they say use water, use vegetable stock. More It'll flavor. bring the flavor right. a lot more than... So we've had these on a couple of minutes, we've had yep. these on a couple of minutes, and we should do it probably in that order because these are going to cook faster? Is that yep, these, are, these don't take long because I feel the biggest uh, reason people don't like Brussels sprouts is when they're mushy. I know when I was growing up, I really didn't like them, but again, once you actually learn how to cook them and... Well, bacon. Well, that plus bacon. Helps. Plus now, bacon. is this similar, because what you just this said kind of rings home. I'm a big broccoli guy, and I don't want my broccoli mushy or blanched out. I love broccoli. Out. I yeah. think it's a very, like, everybody always laughs when I say that. That's one of my favorite vegetables. I, like, really, I really do. I like that, too. I just added a little balsamic glaze in here, because balsamic goes really nice with the sprouts as well. What? There is a little bit of chemistry when you're cooking, isn't it? I mean, you kind of have to know a lot of these things, what will mix with what and, and, right. and right, right through that. That's another reason I kind of geared away from pastry. I like to play with my food, essentially. And right. in pastry, if you put a little too much of something, you have a mess on your hands or it's garbage. So it, it's nice to, you know, I like to be on this side. And so both of these a couple of minutes. And then if you yep. can see this, this is what it looks like in the end. And this is just gorgeous. <laughs> Yeah. It's really outstanding. Now, one of the things that we all know coming into the holidays that a lot of people, and no matter what the meal is, is they, they like their wines. You've selected a couple of here. Tell us a little bit about this and then just give us some of the maybe general rules of, you know, how you try to pair wines with different dishes. So it's pretty much what, I mean, most people have heard before. Whites usually go really well with fish. Um, so for this one, I picked a Chardonnay and I picked a Sauvignon Blanc. 
Um, it would also go very well with a nice light red um, because you have those Brussels sprouts with that bacon and that balsamic. You have the mushrooms in this rice. You know, the salmon, I didn't get to tell you, but we did a, a Dijon maple glaze on it. Oh. We put it in the oven. Um, so you can do a lighter red as well. Um, when you're doing your beef dishes, your heavy beef dishes, that's when you want your Cabernets and your, you know, Pinot Is that all just chemical or taste buds or, or why, why do they say that? You know, personally, I, I don't, I mean, it's just they're heavier wines. It's yeah. a heavier beef, you know, when you have a nice ribeye steak and you have that fat, you need something to help cut it. And I really think that the, those, red, those red grapes help break that up, right. you know, opposed to if you had it with a Sauvignon Blanc, a nice ribeye, I don't think it would... You know, I don't think it would complement the dish really well. Excellent dish. As much as I love to cook, I think <laughs> I'd like to come out and have you do it instead. Yes, the double please. Tree of Willows. <laughs> Alicia Fliss, thank you so much. Alexia Fliss, I'm sorry. <laughs> thank you so much. If you could only have smell TV, you would love it. So yes. thank you. <laughs> thank you Have so a much. great holidays as we're coming up and, and, and just an excellent dish. Thank you so much. That's it for this edition of Uniquely Bristol. We're very thankful you decided to spend time and join us. We want to know what you think. Drop us an email at marketing at bristolct.gov. And if you want to know more about Bristol, our website is bristolallheart.com. We're also on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Until next month, be thankful, and we'll see you then. <music>